Good morning. Welcome. For us, it's a pleasure to start this first course on research. I would like to thank the participation of uh, Cardiovascular Research Foundation. They are leaders in this area of research in the world. And as you have seen in the schedule, uh, Gary Mintz, Juan Granada, and Roxana Miran are going to participate. Good morning, Juan. And uh, from New York, thanks to this uh, video conference system, we have the presence of Dr. Alejandra Gerjikov from CRF. Uh, and I have to thank, especially because of the driving force to this initiative, including the schedule that she has developed. Thank you, Alejandra. Also, thank you uh, to your father, who is here. Many of us uh, want to participate in national and international multi-centric trials. And uh, for one reason or another one, it's very difficult for us to participate. And uh, for some years, we have de developed some uh, registers, like the procedure register by uh, Dr. Mastera and uh, with a lot of difficulty and little collaboration on our behalf, uh, he is working on his own. Uh, and uh, together with uh, the Catheterization Council, we have the RADAC registry. There are several papers that have been submitted. Some of them have been published. And uh, there is a percutaneous aortic implant um, registry and uh, by the Federation and the Association of Cardiology of Argentina and uh, it's been developed but as medical association uh, we have a long way to follow that is why this uh, workshop is the starting point together with uh, Dr. Moreno and uh, Dr. Limpio and uh, Dr. Moreno works in Misiones in the north of Argentina and Jorge Limpio in Salta, also in the north of Argentina. There are many excited uh, physicians who want to participate. This is going to be the starting point of a long pathway to follow, and it's going to be quite advantageous to all of us. So we are going to start with uh, the schedule, Alejandra. Mm. I'm going to invite you to moderate these uh, presentations, and then Juan is going to start. Alejandra. Juan, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. And uh, I would like to know when you're going to have the video and the audio ready. Juan, le decís a Jeff. Jeff, could you, Juan, uh, could you uh, ask Jeff to share the desktop? Well, uh, you, we are all set. You can see the slides, so we can start. So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Alejandra and Ernesto, who were the people who are really involved in developing this schedule together and uh, made this come true. I would have liked to be present in the meeting. But unfortunately, I had uh, an orthopedic health problem and uh, I was not uh, able to attend the DCD. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon, and thank you for uh, having invited me to go to Argentina. In the next 15 minutes, 
I am going to uh, present an overview as far as uh, one of the most important questions for you as researchers, and that is when a device is ready for FIH study, first in human study. So this is very important because this is uh, an easy part, but what is difficult is to do this uh, evaluation in order to be able to uh, deploy this device or to implant uh, this device in a first in human study. And the most important question, the most important overview from the researchers or investigators standpoint is risk evaluation. That is to understand what uh, area of risk uh, is uh, the device located. How do we know it? Well, by understanding the risk when the literature is available in stents. For example, we know that uh, stent uh, thrombosis is the highest risk. So we have a lot of literature of uh, similar devices that tell us about the ranges of the uh, risk of the stent uh, based on uh, old publications. Also, how the device works and uh, what is the potential risk uh, of failure in uh, chronic occlusions, the most important risk are perforations. And there are many sources in the literature, such as the FDA or the CMARC uh, web site. Uh, we can look for data of similar devices and also to see the co potential complications of them. And uh, it's very difficult when we do not have any data available. And that is when preclinical and clinical experience and experimental research is going to help us fill the gaps. So what are the main drivers that uh, determine the device validation? The first is what we call the device class or the application. And uh, also, the risk analysis of the device is very important because many operators sometimes misunderstand what is the inherent uh, risk of that this uh, device might have in the uh, clinical study of the patient. That is why it's very important to understand where we are located, where is the technology as far as risk. When we are testing a mm, drug eluting stent, a, a new generation stent in the coronary territory, we know what the risk uh, and benefits are of these type of technologies when we are using them in a clinical trial. It's quite different when we are using a DES uh, that has a very good clinical and preclinical data to a different territory, for example, below knee stenting for uh, PCI. And uh, it's very different when we are using a new DES design, for example, um, mm, drug eluting balloon. Uh, well, the device uh, is different, but the application is the same. But it's quite different when we have a different uh, device type, a new application, for example, a bioabsorbable stent in a vulnerable plaque, and uh, there are scarce data, and uh, they are just few. When we have a new protocol or technology, we have to place them in the risk scale and uh, where we are classifying these type of devices. The second aspect to be taken into account is what we call the technical dossier. And that is basically where we have the description of the device, the design, the material, the polymers, the drug to be used, the concentration. All this is very important because this is going to determine the overall uh, efficacy and safety of this device. And uh, here we have to make the decision and say, well, I believe that uh, the risk is low or moderate. The technical dossier is truly providing the parameters to understand whether the device has been uh, validated enough to be used in humans. Most of these devices and the initial validation 
uh, do not uh, require to be experimental. Many of these devices have a lot of validation. Uh, the uh, bench texting, ex vivo, uh, for example, most of the valves had been uh, tested in computerized devices, the same as bioabsorbable stents. Mm, there is a lot of uh, ex vivo uh, studies and uh, flow computing uh, before they are extrapolated to the experimental site. And all these devices go through experimental phases in um, computers, ex vivo, in vivo, before they are taken to the in vivo experimental stage. And many of these uh, developmental cycles are very expensive. And in fact, we have to understand what are the cycles by means of which these technologies are tested before they are extrapolated to the design freeze. So um, it means that uh, this device is going to be um, used first in human study. Many times, the technical dossier that you receive is not the technical dossier that corresponds to the latest uh, approved uh, design. That is why it's very important to understand that uh, once we have the technological maturation phase of the device, we have to understand whether this is the very latest device that is going to be tested because many times companies as well as those who are developing technologies make uh, last minute changes that are very important to be understood for the safety and efficacy of the in the patient. But what is most important is to understand experimental data, what we call the proof of context. Uh, we have to be um, really very uh, careful uh, and we have to know that data has been collected appropriately. That is the proof of concept. And uh, something very important for investigators is those who are providing experimental data as far as security. That is very important as far as safety. Most of the technologies uh, at uh, bio-experimental level do not undergo an evaluation process for the search of efficacy. Efficacy is not the interest at experimental or animal level. What we know is to be sure that the device is safe, safe and safe before it undergoes experimental uh, phase at an early stage. That is why it's very important that experimental models are scientifically accepted, that they are accepted uh, and tested and uh, in vascular areas and territories that are similar to uh, those areas in humans. The studies should be done in laboratories with um, proven quality systems and uh, before being used in humans and independent of pathology intermination of the results um, is very important as well. So it's very important for you as investigators when you receive the first experimental data that you should understand that devices undergo different phases. The first phase is what we call the proof of concept phase in which studies are performed in short uh, cycles with a few animals and the idea is to repeat and repeat and repeat the tests so as to understand the acute performance that is the acute development of the device in the short cycles. And that is very important because I wouldn't like to do a first in human study just by uh, being based on this experimental data alone. We have validated all these technologies. This is the study with uh, an occlusion device on the left atrium. Here we have used dogs in order to do this type of validations and the in vivo and the histological part on the low right quadrant has been developed uh, with the company early on, understanding the limitations and the benefits of this device. This device uh, is currently being validated in Chile and we have been able to implant uh, up to 10 of these devices in the Catholic University of Chile. 
uh, well, then we go to the non-GLP testing. This is an acronym that speaks about uh, good preclinical practices. Here, for, uh, we have uh, studies that are much more formal, of higher volumes, and the implants are going to take months. And here we have a fight between the engineers who are very creative and those involved in quality control because the experimental methodology requires longer cycles, different study groups, different time points. And many times the device uh, goes to the chronic phase. Personally, before um, doing uh, first in human study, experimental study, companies and uh, technology developers should have studies in this phase in biological proof. Uh, and these are studies that are much more advanced. They are stiffer and basically the stent or the device should be used in the territories that are going to be used in humans. Here you can see a drug eluding stent tested in the uh, femoral territory of atherosclerotic uh, pigs. And here you can see the analytical methodology of, of pathology also goes a um, formal process so as to have a report based on which the investigator is going to be able to understand what are the potential applications or the side effects that these uh, stents might have. When we reach a much more advanced uh, stage, that is the GLP studies, which basically uh, require high standards with uh, a more stringent control at longer term. And this is used for uh, validation testing. And all these GLP studies are um, developed thinking about the FDA when the device has uh, been completed. It is very important that these GLP phases are very formal with uh, standardized processes with uh, completed processes, and it requires that the device is in a completion stage so as to be able to submit uh, the device to the regulatory phase. As investigators, it's very important for you to understand what are the red flags um, so as to be concerned uh, about uh, these, uh, the validation of these devices, experimental studies um, in animal models that have not been validated out of the box models with the experimental methodologies that are not applicable to uh, clinical practice. For example, uh, stands to be used in the coronary territory but ha that have been tested in um, peripheral territories, also diagnostic modalities, endpoints out of the range of biological processes Ability. And uh, here we have, uh, for example, stents that have not been validated in the long run. And uh, also there are uh, investigators that do not have experience to do these type of studies. For you as investigators, it's very important to understand um, based on the technical dossier, uh, what is the validation cycle of this device? Is it an early validation or intermediate validation? because this is what is truly going to help us to understand uh, the risk uh, scheme. Um, and uh, in order to conclude, I'm going to speak about ethical considerations. I think that whenever we want to do a study in uh, humans, the intent is to advance science and technology. But it's very important to understand that at the end, in the long run, what we want is to have the patient in the first place. And uh, the canon of um, medical ethics regarding experimentation and studies in FI, uh, first in human studies, well, the most uh, difficult part is that we are speaking about emerging and new technologies. And many times, we have to have a clear idea regarding what is safety and efficacy. But basically, for me as investigator, the first thing to be taken into account my priority is to assume that there is an incremental value of technology over what has already been developed. So 
basically this uh, really drives us to do this type of research. If uh, the technology that is being proposed has no incremental value whatsoever regarding what is uh, already in place, I would really doubt to um, experiment with this device in humans. Uh, to end, I would like to show you how long these processes can be. This is the first robotic and jobless tea system in the world. We had the possibility of uh, being part of this experiment. The company was founded in 2012. We did the first experimental validation research in our research center in 2006. The company was founded in 2002, and uh, we uh, did the FIH study in patients in 2010, and uh, the FDA was uh, approved this uh, methodology in 2012. Ten years of uh, hard work with the company, with the FDA, so as to approve this um, innovation cycle of this technology. To conclude, first of all, I would recommend investigators to classify the risk of the device as far as materials, applications in the clinics, and uh, potential risks of failure. Secondly, to be sure that uh, the study can be started by understanding that this is the latest generation of the device and that uh, experimental uh, data support this device. It's very important to evaluate the experimental and preclinical data to understand what are the studies done, what are the risks that were taken, and the types of implications at the experimental level. Also, we have to understand whether there has been adverse outcomes, as usually animal models are good predictors of these safety events. And uh, many times, uh, we uh, are based on the poor pigs that are showing us the data obtained. And you, as investigators, have to do the due diligence for this type of events. This is very important, because if you invest time in evaluating preclinical data and the technical dossier, many times you, as investigators or as a research center, are going to have problems with adverse clinical events in uh, with the use of uh, devices that have not been well tested. So if you invest time in the evaluation of data, in due diligence and uh, so as to be able to help the patient, I believe that this is going to uh, carry very good uh, impact for you uh, as individuals, investigators, and your research centers. Thank you very much. Gracias, Juan. Thank you, Juan. There are people to us on the web, therefore we, we may have the five minute questions for the online participants and the people, the attendees as well. Is there any question from the web? There's no question from the web. Is there any question from the audience? Good morning, Juan. I want to ask you, I mean, since the proof of concept with safe biological therapies to the submittal to an agency like the FDA, are there short circuits in terms of making the authorization processes more dynamic when there, there is safety in, the, in phase one, for example? The specific question is whether if with the proof of concept data at an experimental level, we might we might cut down on the processes or reduce the processes. Moreover, in biological therapies that involve, for example, cellular therapy or other uh, cell transfer processes. If I get your question well, 
The answer is it's relatively simple. I believe that there's no way from, the, from my point of view of bypassing or accelerating the process of a, a clinical stage of any device, wherever it is in Colombia, Argentina, or anywhere. The reason why the first in human trials have been in, done in the US is basically due to not to reasons of logistics or acceleration. I mean, moreover, is the fact that these cases, I mean, it's not related to hospitals, uh, difficulties and costs, but the ethical barriers for the development of this type of device should be the same wherever they are developed. The difficulty of assessing this kind of protocol is that we need some sort of understanding and knowledge regarding the development and validation of these technologies to have uh, an appropriate judgment to know when they are ready for first in human. And many countries, many centers don't have that knowledge. That is why it is important to work with the teams that have this knowledge first, and second, they can classify the risk concept. The risk concept is very important because you have the trial, and, it, and the trial is set at a level that you, as a researcher or an investigator, you may say, well, I can get in I can engage here because I mean this is I understand what it is about all oh, there are too many risks I mean so you're able to assess the risk I don't know whether I answered your question correctly but I believe that that is what you meant Dr. Greenfield wants to ask a question hello Juan good morning welcome to Argentina at least on the video conference. We will be missing you, but this is very good. There is a, it, it, this is a comment and a question about how a device is approved by similarity, because we have had some devices, not only cardiac devices, because I don't want to focus specifically on, on something that is connected to cardiology, but other devices that by similarity have been approved or have been approved by our regulatory agency. That is, they, they state, this device, by description, is equal to another one. A is almost equal to B, therefore it is approved without requiring mechanical tests, without doing any first in humans or anything that might state that this device is approved by similarity because the results are equal. I mean, what can we, what do we require from that device? Should they have a clinical trial backing them? Because, I mean, we have had a case like this, not only in cardiology, but in other fields as well. They've said that A is equal to B, but then in practice you realize that A and B have nothing to do. And that is something that uh, as a uh, um, college, uh, um, an association of CATH experts, we need to advise our uh, a regulator, because we don't have baseline research or phase one research, we have very little, so that we need to provide advice to our regulator. I would like to know your opinion about that, or, or you and your opinion and other people's opinions as well. Thank you. Well, for me, the answer is very simple. You can compare devices based on functioning similarity or mechanism similarity. First of all, you will look at the details. 
the way they are manufactured, of the way these devices are manufactured. There are fundamental differences in the way the materials they are manufactured, the materials are used, the, whether they are uh, they elude drugs, I mean, how they are quoted. There are so many variables that may affect the effectiveness, the clinical effectiveness, safety, and efficacy of these devices, that small variation in the manufacturing process of these devices may jeopardize their efficiency and efficacy. I believe that the FDA has moved to one extreme, I mean, has a radical way of assessing the validation process of devices, but I believe that the way in which devices should be approved, I mean, the, meaning approving devices without a minimum process, counting on technical and uh, clinical data is a mistake. And you might put patients' lives at risk. Therefore, for me, there are no barriers to validation. And sometimes I'm quite disturbed when people state that emerging markets are interesting because of, of, of the way the because of the approval processes. But for me, validation barriers are just to be respected. They need to have clinical and technological data to be able to approve them. Because when you turn when the uh, a system becomes inefficient, you, you end up having social problems and other things. Is there any other question or comment? Well, then we will move on to our following presentation that will be delivered by Dr. Alejandra Gerchikov. Thank you, Juan. Now, Alejandra will be making her presentation. <laughs> 